with bullet points appearing, you're going to be reading ahead, which is a bit annoying. But um, yeah, let's just go with it. It is what it is. The joy, the joy of online training, which we've all been through for the last three years. OK, so my name is Douglas Bell. Please call me Doug. I know a few of you in the audience today already. Um, I'm a professor of education with Nottingham University on their Ningbo campus in mainland China. Been out here now for about six years and about six years before that, so quite a good stretch in China. My presentation today, which I hope you can all see, sing out if you suddenly can't see anything, is called A Matter of Critical Deconstruction or of Critically Taking Stock. Um, the conference title, as you know, is about deconstructing the AP. I'm, I'm going to argue today, I'm going to be a bit provocative perhaps, and argue that I don't think we should be spending our time deconstructing the AP per se. I think we should be actually critically taking stock. Uh, and it will become apparent in my presentation today, hopefully, why, why, I hold, why I hold those views. So I'm going to give you a qualitative SWOT analysis of EAP as it stands at the moment. So a strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats of the field of EAP. That's what we're about today. So let me start. Um, so this should be appearing slide by uh, point by point, but we'll have to live with this. First of all, it's four parts for presentation. Um, the first part, I often start my presentations like this actually, is to say a little bit about why I chose this topic. And I'll give you a few personal perspectives on, on why this topic is important to me and why I think it's valid. I'll then dive in and talk about what I see as being the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats currently facing the AP. Um, that will seg you into talking about what I think is some lessons from history, things that we need to learn. Um, but I'm going to question, are they being learned? So some lessons from history, but are they being learned? Are we learning from what's gone before? In the final part of the presentation today, uh, I'll ask some questions around what I think the, the future for EAP holds. And as I've said here, this as of yet, these are still open questions. It's a bit of an unanswered um, space there just yet. So why this topic? Just to lead in. Um, I've been working in English language teaching since the 1980s, uh, which is a surprisingly long time now. It frightens me. 35 years. I'm actually year 36 now. And about 25 of those years have been spent directly in EAP. I've taught EAP in the UK, in Turkey, in the States, in China, in Australia. Um, so fairly international flavour of EAP all around the world. And as I say, about 25 years in the field. Some of you in the audience I know today even longer than that, considerably longer than that. So it's a good stretch. Um, the second reason, I guess, a personal perspective to share is I did my PhD focusing particularly on EAP. My thesis, I finished my thesis not that long ago, 2016, and the title you can see there. I was looking at practitioners, pedagogies, and professionalism in EAP. Uh, so I was looking at the history of EAP, the development of EAP, how people become professionals, uh, how pedagogies work in EAP, all of that. This was the topic for my, my PhD thesis. Point three, a bit of a shameless plug here, but this year I've, I've just written a new book. It's coming out, all being well, later this summer. It's, it's undergoing some revisions at the moment, um, but it should go on sale in the summer. And this is called English for Academic Purposes, Perspectives on the Past, Present and Future. And um, as, I say, as I say in the final bullet point there, I have got a genuine and sustained 25 years and sustained personal interest in EAP's history and the way it's developed. Um, and this has really given birth to the book and earlier than that to my PhD thesis. So let me just say a little bit about the PhD research because I'm going to be drawing on it quite heavily today and on research that I did for my book. But when I was doing my thesis back in, in the, well, 2012 when I started, finished in 2016, I, I interviewed at that time 15 very prominent, well-known people from the EAP community. And these were people spanning basically for at least four decades. It was people who'd started, the first group of people were people who'd started in EAP back in the 1960s. And then there were people who'd started in the 70s, people in the 80s, 
when the final group of people who started in the field in the 90s, late 80s, 90s, which is sort of my generation, if you like. Uh, and I wanted to get these different perspectives of people who've been in the field for a long time uh, to see how the field has developed. So very interested in the history of the field. Those 15 people I interviewed, they were all different places all around the world. Um, 13 of the 15 were happy to go on record and be named. So for those people, I can say who some of those people were. I, I was talking to people like Professor Henry Widdison, um, Professor Ken Hyland, I think you're in the audience today, Ken, um, Abel Coxhead, various household names you all recognize these people from EAP, Owen Alexander, Andy Gillett, people who are well known in the AP and who've shaped the field of EAP. And I, I chose those people very deliberately because I wanted to see in every decade how perspectives might have shifted. Two of the people I interviewed requested anonymity, two professors, so I won't tell you who they were, but I will be quoting from some of their comments uh, in the body of my talk today. And so that was my doctoral research back in 2016. Um, more recently for this, this book that I've just done this year, I wrote it over the last, the last year and a half, I went back to some of those professors. I wanted to see if anything had changed. You know, we're almost a decade on from when I was doing my doctorate. And I thought, well, it would be useful as part of the book to go back and talk to some of those people again and see if their perspectives have changed. So I went back and talked to a handful of those people again, and I'll be sharing um, their data, the qualitative data that I gathered in this talk today. OK. So. Let's jump in. Strengths, first of all, if we were talking about strengths in the AP, I think the first strength I would make mention of is simply that EAP has expanded significantly. It's it's become a massive concern. You see a quote here from one of the people I interviewed recently for the book. You can read what that person says there. You know, there's an ever increasing demand for EAP, and that's global. Pretty much every university around the world in some shape or another now does EAP. So that's a definite strength. I don't think we would dispute that. As part of that expansion, I think it's worth pointing out as a strength that EAP has widened its scope. If we look at the history of EAP and you go back to say the 70s, the early days, I'm thinking of some of the work by Bob Jordan at that time, he had some definitions for EAP going back to 1975. Back then it tended to be pretty much study skills, university-based study skills, that was it, that was EAP. But if you look at definitions of EAP these days, it's much broader than that. We've got EAP um, happening even in almost in primary schools. You know, it's, it's much wider. It's not just in the university and it covers a lot more things. It covers research, it covers teacher training, it covers copywriting. So the scope of EAP has, has broad and significant. As part of that, um, we look at EAP as a discipline, as a field. It's got its own professional organisations. Bali, obviously, being a key example, it's its own conferences where you are today, where I am now. Um, it's all meta language. You know, we talk about EGAP, ESAP, rights analysis. This is all meta language unique to EAP. Uh, it's got its own recognition schemes, its own accreditation mechanism. So I'm stealing a quote from you, Ken, if you're in the audience. Good article you wrote there in 2018 about this. And as you say, I fully agree, EAP has got all the trappings of a fully fledged educational practice. It's got all of these things. So that's obviously a strength, right? And I would argue because of that, we could say EAP has come of age. You know, it's 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 a very young field. It's only been around since the late 60s, 1970s. I think EAP as a term was first coined in 1977. I can remember 1977, so it's not that long ago. Um, it's a young field. So it's come a long way in that time. And that's obviously a strength. Great. OK, so far, so good. Those are the strengths. But there's a but coming. Always a but. Unfortunately, there are also some weaknesses. Now, I think the first weakness is one you'll all be familiar with. It's this idea of us working for the disciplines rather than with them. And you'll be familiar with Anne Rain's, Rain's um, quote about, you know, working as the butler, the butler stance. We work for the disciplines rather than with them. And, you know, this is a quote from one of the people I interviewed in 2016, 
in the disciplines, they seem to think you're just the grammar guy. And most of the people I interviewed said something like this. They said, oh, yeah, we're seen as the fixers. You know, we're just the grammar fixers. I remember talking to, to, to Liz Hamplines about this some years ago, and she said, yeah, you know, we're seen as the people who fix up the language. So we're working for the disciplines rather than with them. That's, that's a weakness. I think a related weakness, and actually I think a bigger weakness, is we still have a continual lack of clearly posted introduced into the, into the profession. I mean, how do you become an EAP teacher? The quotation I've got here is from one of my graduate students from a couple of years ago, a guy called Robert Lowton. He did his dissertation, his master's dissertation about qualifications in EAP. He was building on some of the work I looked at earlier. And it's really interesting. I'll share his, his dissertation with you at the end, the citation for it, the reference. Um, but the people he interviewed, he interviewed lots of people around the UK, different universities responsible for recruiting EAP tutors. And this is what one of them said. You know, there isn't an obvious route into EAP. How do you become an EAP teacher? It's very fragmented. We all come in from different directions. That, I think, is a weakness. Um, perhaps as a corollary of that, and this again will be familiar to all of you, I'm sure, is that we have comparatively low status in the academy. Um, and again, a few quotes from my interviewees back in 2016. EAP teachers were seen as lower down the pecking order, never seen as full academics in the same way. You see the second quote there, people being treated differently, problems with status. Um, I thought it would be interesting to talk to these people this last year to see if anything had changed on this. And somewhat depressingly, they confirmed to me that in their opinion anyway, it hasn't. You know, look at this first person. Status, big disappointment. It's not getting any better. In fact, it may even be getting worse. And the other person as well, their continued low status of EAP. And it's this idea we have that, well, if you speak English, anybody can do that. And a blurring perhaps of the boundaries between EAP and, you know, mainstream TEFL. This is one of the problems, I think. It's a weakness. Another weakness, I think, is there's a pretty big disconnect, I would say, between the qualifications that people get, but what the field actually requires of them. So a quotation here from, from my book, sorry for the shameless plug, um, I would argue that the qualifications most people are accepting are still generic. You know, we're talking about deltas, MAT sols, um, but it's quite possible to get a job in EAP and know absolutely nothing about EAP. And that surely is problematic. You wouldn't find that in other disciplines. You know, if you want to be a dentist, you have to train to be a dentist. If you want to be a civil engineer, you know, you have to train to be a civil engineer. But somewhat perversely, to my mind, this isn't the case yet in EAP. People come in with generic qualifications, and then the job requires something different of them. As I say, for me, that's problematic. Um, the reason it's problematic is because what goes on in the EAP class is not the same thing as what goes on in the general English class. And again, I'm sure you're familiar with this. There's a lot of literature out there now that talks about the differences between EAP and general English. And, and this is not to, you know, lump all teaching under the general English banner. Some people have criticised uh, people like myself for talking about this division, say, well, general English, you can't talk about general English, there's lots of types of English. And yeah, for sure, there are, you know. But EAP is a different ball game. It's not the same thing. So we have this disconnect, I would say, and that's a weakness. Um, the problem with that, I think, and again, I base this on, on my you know, 25 years of watching this happen, particularly when I've been working as a head of EAP units, and I've watched new staff come in. New teachers very often, when they come into EAP, they, they go through a kind of apprenticeship. Even very experienced teachers from general English or from some other form of English, they come into EAP and in the first year or two, or maybe not that long, but certainly the first year, six months, they're completely all at sea. And the literature kind of supports this. I mean, there's some work, it's quite a while ago now, by Olin, Olin Alexander, 2009. She, her research at the time, she said, yeah, the teachers talk about feeling de-skilled because it seems that their previous experiences are no longer required. So they have to go through a kind of unlearning process. And that's problematic, surely, I think. 
Moving on, another weakness of EAP as a field is poor job stability and a lack of upward career progression. And look at the comments here from two of the professors that I interviewed recently, just this last year. Um, you know, the first professor there saying, well, if you look at the contracts offered now, it, you know, they're not even bottom steps on a ladder because there's no ladder, there's no obvious ladder. And that's that's certainly very true in my own institution here. You're basically either an EAP tutor or you're a manager, which would be a senior tutor. And that's it. There's nowhere else to go. You know, it's not the same as an academia where you come into an academic faculty, you're a teaching fellow, then you're an assistant professor, then you're an associate professor, and if you're very lucky, you finally make it to the lofty heights of professor. But there's that upward career progression in the academic disciplines. We don't have that in the AP, so it, it's it's very precarious, um, and that's a major issue, as the sort of respondents say, is a major weakness. Another weakness is a widening gap between research and practice. Mary Davis in 2019, she pointed out uh, most EAP practitioners are not in fact researchers or authors of journal publications. Most people working in the field don't tend to publish stuff. As Liz Hunt Lyons pointed out, most teachers, they don't have that as a job uh, requirement and they're not likely to get a grant in the same way that other academic disciplines were. So there's a gap between research and practice. Um, a related area with that gap, this is a quote from one of the people I interviewed in 2016, and I fully agree with this. Um, even when we look at the research, we look at what is published in the AP, there tends to be a bias, I think, towards what I would call the what of EAP, which is really language analysis. You know, if you go into the journals um, and you look at what's being published, the, the emphasis has been traditionally on genre analysis. So you're looking at lots of linguistic analysis of different texts, not such a focus on the teaching of it, what it means in the classroom. Um, I see that as a weakness. And as this respondent said, there's been an inver inversion of the real priorities. And I, I, I absolutely agree with that. Um, just to back up a bit why I agree with that so strongly, I wrote an article a couple of years ago, well, a year ago, in Jeep, you may have seen it. Um, and I was talking about methodology in EAP or just teaching pedagogy. Why is it still overlooked? Why do we still have this problem? And I was building on work that had been done by uh, Richard Watson Todd in Thailand back in 2003. He wrote a seminal article back then, I felt, called TEAP or uh, EAP or TEAP. And he was arguing back then, you know, we're focusing on EAP as a, as a what, as a product. We're not focusing on it as a how, how you actually do it. And that's still the case. I mean, when I, when I wrote this article last year for Jeep, I actually looked at 18 years worth of Jeep articles and I did a Boolean search um, under methodology, under pedagogy, and the results were quite depressing. I think I got 11 articles that focused explicitly on methodology um, and maybe double that that focused on pedagogy. Most of the articles simply aren't looking at those things. And I find that personally, as a, as a teacher, I find that rather disconcerting. And, we don't see that in mainstream language teaching. If you go into TESOL quarterly or ELTJ, you're going to see research papers, but a lot of them are still going to look at what goes on in the classroom. We don't seem to do that in the AP. I feel in the AP often there's an emphasis to be everything but the classroom. And that, I, I personally, I find that very worrying. OK, that's the bad news. What about the good news? Are there any opportunities? Well, I've listed four opportunities here. I'm not the first person to say this, by the way, I, I wouldn't claim to be, but the first point there, it seems to me there's a huge opportunity to make EAP more open to everybody. Traditionally, certainly in the UK, EAP was only ever offered to foreign students, to non-native English speakers. And I think that's a, a massive mistake. I think EAP should actually be offered to everybody in the university. And maybe one way to do that is to link more closely with ACLIT, with Academic Literacy, I know some universities are starting to do this. A colleague is telling me that this is happening in Coventry. And I think some of you in the audience today are from Coventry. So while we talk at the end, maybe you can, you can confirm if that's the case. But I do think EAP should be offered to everybody because 
native speakers, you know, how to write an essay, how to do the presentation. These are not innate skills. It's not something that we're born with. We learn how to do that or we learn by trial and error. How much better if you could be formally taught how to do that as we do the EAP. So that's an opportunity. And if we did that, I think it would strengthen EAP's position within the academy. Okay? Another way that we can strengthen our position in the academy is to share our very obvious expertise in teaching and pedagogy with those new to HE. I'm sure all of you in the room, you'll be familiar with the PGC HE from the UK. If you're an academic these days, a new academic, you're required to do the PGC HE. Interestingly, EAP teachers are not required to, certainly not, and they're not, because it's recognised that we've already got teaching knowledge, teaching expertise. And it seems to me that we should be sharing that more. And it is happening. A few of my colleagues within Nottingham, certainly other universities I'm familiar with, they're kind of sidestepping out of the EAP into centres for teaching excellence, or they're working with the PGCHE people. Um, and I think that's that would be a good thing. It helps to safeguard what we do. Opportunity three, producing and publishing more research on EAP teaching. So this goes back to what I was saying about the what and the how. I think there needs to be more work. There's an opportunity there to look more at pedagogy. And related to that, the fourth one, there's an opportunity for more interdisciplinary work, whether that's work on you know, how to teach a particular form of, of, of ESAP, or whether it's helping those academics to publish their papers. I, I do a bit of work here with, with, with non-native speaker academics on polishing up their papers to help them publish um, here in China. So there's opportunities there for EAP professionals. Well, finish on the bad news, what about the threats? I've talked about the strengths, the weaknesses, opportunities. What about the threats? Well, the first threat, the first one out of the gates is there's been a, a withering on the vine in the last few years of TEEP qualifications. I mean, in fact, if I wind back in time to the early 2000s, uh, my team and I at the University of Plymouth, we actually set up the first PGC TEEP in the UK. And I predicted at that time that other universities would, would copy and would follow suit. I remember being interviewed by the EO Gazette. And, and my predictions largely came true. There were a lot of places started, or a handful of places started to offer PGC teeps. So Leicester offered one, Sheffield Hallam offered one, Nottingham offered one. I wasn't working for Nottingham then, but they jumped on that bandwagon. What we've witnessed in the last few years, though, is they're all closing down. Nottingham had an MA in teaching EAP, that's now defunct. Northampton had an MA, that's also now defunct, I believe. Leicester, PGC teep, currently on hold. Sheffield Hallam's PGC teeth on hold. So there's there's a gradual withering on the vine here. That's that's not good. That's a threat. A larger threat, of course, to all of us in education, whether you work in the EAP or you work in philosophy, is the shift towards you know neoliberalization of education, education as business. I think we'd all agree that that, that is still a threat to education in general. Um, because one of the things that comes out of that is there's been this steady proliferation of private EAP providers. Um, now, just to pin my colours to the mast here, I, I don't have any problem with individual EAP teachers working for private providers. I worked for myself. Earlier in my career, um, I worked with Kaplan at Nottingham Trent University. I was working for the, the Nottingham Trent International College. So, so I worked with the private providers. My, my beef, if you like, with the private provider thing is simply that it's eroding EAP's status in the academy. It's pushing EAP further over to that service provider status, taking us further away from being recognised as a discipline. So that's that's why I see the private provider thing as a threat. And um, if we wind back, I mean, in 2008, Mary Ann Ansell published a paper then, um, and she identified 18 partnerships in the UK with private providers. For my doctoral research, I looked at the situation, and by 2016, only eight years later, that number had gone up to 61. So it went from eight, 18 to 61. Um, looking at it now, it's 70 plus and still growing. So this is you know, a huge expansion of private providers, and there are some knock-on effects there, as I said. Another threat are political changes around the role and status of English. I mean, here in China, for example, there's been some talk recently 
about whether English should still be recognised on the high school examination or not, or whether it should still have the same status. Now, if that were to change, if English suddenly moved out of the core subjects in the Chinese Gaokao, the high school exam, that would have a huge ripple effect for EAP because then English isn't going to be seen as, as important in China and that's going to have a knock on. And there were similar things going on in Hong Kong a few years ago around the status of English. So these are threats. Uh, we've just come out of COVID, all of us, um, but I think there are some online legacies of COVID that remain as threats. I, I work as a, an external academic advisor for three different universities at the moment, one in the UK, two in Hong Kong. And it struck me this year when I was doing some work with those institutions that there's quite a few things that they're still doing post-COVID simply because it's convenient to do so. And I actually picked it up in one of my reports at one of these institutions. And I said, well, you know, I can't really see a good pedagogic reason for doing some of these things now online. COVID's passed. You know, I see it. Maybe you're looking at it as, a, as a, an economic thing. That, oh, we can just record this and do it online. And therefore, we don't need to hire a teacher. We don't need to hire office space. You know, these sorts of little invidious threats, online legacies of COVID, as I'm calling them, I see these as big threats. And of course, the last one, um, artificial intelligences, we've been absolutely hammered in the news of late about chat GPT. At the conference, I was looking at the conference schedule earlier, I see there's four or five talks I would have liked to have gone to that are dealing with AI and chat GPT and translation. This is a huge, a huge threat. There's no question about it. It's almost as if we're witnessing an arms race. I was talking to a colleague who works with Turnitin, and they were saying, yeah, or he was saying, we're, we're rushing to bring out a version of Turnitin this year that will counterbalance chat GPT. So it's, it's almost like looking at the Cold War era with America and Russia, you know, back in the 80s, this kind of arms race. So these are the threats. So dabbling a bit now because of time, but some, some lessons from history, but are they being learned? Well, when I was doing my doctoral research and I was surveying the history of EAP from the 1960s right up to now, something that jumped out at me massively was how recursive our field is, how the same things come round and round. And so it seems to me there's some lessons that we should be learning, but we're not. So the first lesson I've got here is what I'm calling safeguarding the supply of new practitioners. And if you wind back and you look at what was happening in the 1980s with ESP, EST, at that time there was an article, a very prescient article by Jack Ewer, and he was highlighting a problem there with ESP teachers. There was a shortage of qualified teachers, experienced teachers. Now, what happened back then was that a lot of the UK universities started offering MAs in ESP. We had Aston University, Birmingham University, Warwick, I think, University, were offering MAs in ESP to, to deal with this supply and demand. We're not seeing that happen with EAP. The evidence, as I said a moment ago, these are withering on the vine. The evidence is that masters in EAP haven't really taken off. So what does that mean for the future? What, what effect is that going to have for the new generation of EAP practitioners? Yeah, that's it. That's a, a question, I think. Um, the next one I would say is a lesson of history is deepening practitioners' awareness and knowledge of the field. And I was talking about this some years ago with Professor Henry Widdison, one of those people I, I'd interviewed. Uh, and this is a quote from what uh, Professor Widdison had said. And again, I fully concur. You know, he says, I'd like there to be, there needs to be, a greater awareness of the history of thinking about EAP. There seems to be a disregard or an ignorance of what has happened before. Um, and we see this wheel being reinvented all the time when you look at the history, if you wade through it over the last 60 years, things are going round and round and being reinvented, repackaged. And I, I, I think that's that's worrisome. We need to learn from that. You know, I, I don't think you would find this the same way in other disciplines. You know, I don't think medical practitioners sit around debating what are antibiotics or are antibiotics useful. It's a given. We know what they are but we do see it in the EAP. So there's a lack of awareness. And this, I guess, goes back to what I was saying about the lack of qualifications, because if we don't have dedicated EAP qualifications, education, training, how do new people learn about this? How do they know? So I very much subscribe to the idea that we have to know where we've come from, 
if we want to know where we're going. Yeah. The the final lesson from history, and this one really shocked me at the time, um, is, is going back to this thing again about academic recognition and respect. And when I was doing my doctoral research, I looked back at some stuff that was published in the 1990s. So a very interesting article here by Martha Pennington, who now retired, was, I believe, was was based in Hong Kong. But if you look at what Martha Pennington is saying back then, this is decades ago, she was saying then, you know, we need to watch out, guys. If we recognise as only a master's discipline, we're always going to be seen as second class citizens. We need to be upgrading our qualification base to get more academic recognition and, and respect. If we don't do that, we settle for being second class citizens in the society of PhDs. Now, for me, it, it's actually quite shocking to look at the date here. You know, 1992, this is being flagged as an issue for the field. Now we're in 2023. Not a lot has changed as far as I can see. More people are getting PhDs. Many of you in the room today will have PhDs or will be doing PhDs, but it's not common. And most of the, the, this, the teachers I work with here, the EAP teachers, 80 to 100 of them, I would probably say 95% or more do not have PhDs. So they are instantly within the academy given that second class citizenship. Uh, and that's that's problematic. So what does the future hold? Not the one eye all the time. Um, some open questions, it seems to me. First question, this thing about academic status. What's going to happen to EAP? Is it ever going to achieve full academic status? Or is it going to slip even further back to this role as service provider? Um, I must admit, my own take on this is, is quite pessimistic. I think we're probably so far down that road now, it's going to take something cataclysmic for us to get that ground back. Uh, but that's just a personal, rather pessimistic view. But it's a question. What's going to happen with the status? As part of that, will EAP as a discipline be able to reduce its permeability. One of one of the reasons EAP has these problems around status, and I, and I you know I went into this in my in my doctorate thesis, doctoral thesis, is because EAP as a field is very permeable. It's quite easy to get into, unlike some other fields. So how we build our knowledge, how we build our epistemology, is that going to stay the way it is now, or are we going to do something to change that? A little more positively, point three, will, will AAP continue to develop beyond the academy? Here, I'm much more optimistic. I mean, here in China, I see EAP happening almost at the primary school level. I've got parents coming to talk to me here in university saying, oh, can you help my daughter learn how to write better essays? And I say, oh, OK, how old's your daughter? Ten, you know, <laughs> ten or eleven. So maybe this is maybe there's a glimmer of hope here that this is an area that EAP will go into back to what I was saying about academic literacy um a personal question here will EAP as a discipline become more rounded will we get a bit more interest in the the who and the how rather than just the what so I'd like to see more of a focus on pedagogy teaching the practicalities of EAP uh Two remaining questions, how will EAP be impacted by advances in, the, in AI? So what is ChatGPT going to do to us? And how will EAP continue to be impacted by these global economic, social, political events? You know, three years ago, none of us could have foreseen the world of COVID. If somebody had said to me three years ago, well, Professor, all of your teaching is going online for about two years, I would, I would have scoffed as impossible. But, um, it happened. So how are we going to continue to be impacted by these things that are largely beyond our control? So open questions. But it seems to me, closing observation here, that whichever way we look at it, the educational world is no longer the way we used to know it. You know, I think we, we can't rely on any of the, what I'm calling here, traditional certainties. I think, you know, whether the future is bright, whether the future is orange or the future is dark, we don't know. But one thing I'm absolutely sure of from my quarter century of working in EAP, I'm convinced, is that if we're going to stay one step ahead of the game, those of us involved in the management and delivery of EAP, we need to keep our eyes very firmly on the ball and not be complacent about anything. Um, we're living in a VUCA world, as, as many people call it. Yeah. And this, I guess, 
finishes off, it goes back to the, the topic of uh, the presentation today and the conference. You know, personally, I don't think we should be deconstructing EAP in the sense of deliberating, you know, what's EAP. I think we should be taking critical stock of where we are, where we've come from, what dangers and threats face us, and what we're going to do about that. That would be that would be my take. So I'm being a bit provocative, but that would be my take on, on things. So the references um, for the talk today in my slides, they're listed here. I should say if anybody would like to have my slides, email me. I'll put my email up in a moment. More than happy to share. Um, if you want to have a look at anything I've, I've referenced here, that's fine. For example, uh, Robert's dissertation or my thesis, anything. It's all on here. Um, thank you very much for listening. I'm talking into the great unknown, but thank, thank you for listening. And uh, it looks like we have five, ten minutes for questions. <laughs>